Welcome everyone to Larger Stories Book of the Month webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about the book, God of My Fathers. It was written by my father, Dr. Larry Crabb, and his father, my grandfather, Larry Crabb Sr. Just a few quick announcements before we start to dive into today's <laughs> conversation. Um, on July 27th, at 4 o'clock Eastern Time, I'm going to be chatting about the book, Connecting, another one of Dr. Crabb's books that I think you'll be excited to, uh, to hear about and perhaps dive into. So be looking for that webinar on July 27th at 4 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern Time. Um, and we've also got some new things that are going to be coming out. We'll talk a little bit about those, I think, during that time as well with some additional things that I think you'll be excited to hear about that Larger Story's up to. So be looking for that on July 27th. And also today, I am joined by my little brother, Ken Crabb. And he and I each have a little piece in this book. And this is really special for us and why we chose this book today is because this is Father's Day month. And um, I thought, what, what a better thing to do than to honor our dad by talking about a book that he wrote about his dad. And, um, and we can think about that a little bit. So Ken, thanks for joining me today, bro. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. I had not uh, read God of My Father in probably 25 years uh, until... Um, the last couple of days, and just I was blown away by the more impact it's had. When I first read God of My Father, I was not a father. Yeah. Now I'm a father of, of three, uh, two of whom are heading off to college in the next six months, one of whom's heading off to college in less than two months. Uh, and, and so it just was a much deeper read for me. I was glad to uh, get to uh, go over it again. It was hugely impactful. That's, I had similar feelings, obviously, when you and I wrote our small pieces in this book. I can remember I, I was, it was before Kimmy and I were married. The book was actually published in 1994. So that was, we were kind of trying to write from that perspective, but everyone knows that when you, when you publish a book in 94, it was written usually in 93 or 92, or sometimes who knows when it was written actually. So we wrote that book um, probably in early 93 is when we had a chance to read the finished manuscript or maybe it was mid 93. And then we wrote um, wrote our pieces in it. And it, it was interesting because dad was 50 years old when he wrote that book. And yeah. I, I just I just get I just get floored that we're mm -hmm. older than he was when he wrote that book. And, and this book really does expose some things about dad, too, and some of the struggles that he had and some of the things that were um, really powerful to read. I, I, I found it fantastic to read it again. And um, I found myself in tears many, many times. As I was going through this book, yeah, and we'll save this for the end. But uh, the, the whole idea of letter writing. Um, mm -hmm. Our grandpa Crab was a big letter writer. Our father was a big letter writer. There's a very brief letter to Kep and I at the end of the book, which I'll I'll read at the end. Uh, but I think one of the things after um, Dad died, February twenty eighth, twenty twenty one. About six weeks after he died, in my prayer life, I started referring to God the Father as Dad. And it, because Dad imaged Jesus to me and God to me in, in a way that no one else ever has. Um, and, and so that just increased the intimacy of my prayer life. Mm -hmm. And when I'm praying for my wife and my girls and Kimmy and, you know, just the different family members, and I'm praying to Dad, yeah. um, and I understand Heavenly the father. dad I'm referring to is God the Father, but it just increases that connection. Um, I, I, I almost sense his caring because yeah. I can picture our dad. I can picture our dad's face. I've had a million conversations with him. And my, my prayer life the past 15 months um, has just been dynamically changed because of the dad we had. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make it through this webinar today with you without getting too crazy in terms of bumbling and crying and whatnot, but this is an important book. It, it, it starts to make me really think of what is the role of, of a person's father? Um, just to kind of be celebrating on Father's Day. And, and we're doing, yeah. What we're, should we be, yeah. should, what should we be celebrating on Father's Day? Um, as you said earlier, Kep, just in the, prior to getting on, you know, unfortunately around the world, there's a crisis of fatherless homes and we see the impact of that. And um, we did not have a fatherless home. Yeah. And I have so many Christian friends that are guys, you know, our age, they're in their fifties, mid fifties. And they're saying, man, I'm so envious of 
the upbringing you had, how your dad taught you the Bible, how your dad just leaned in and was so intentional and, and wrote all those letters. No doubt. Um, I didn't have a dad like that. And, and my response is, well, be a dad like that. Yeah, right. You know, give, give your kids what you're envious of, which is rightfully, you know, we're so over blessed with our upbringing, but be that dad, <laughs> you know, raise your kids in that environment. And with that kind of biblical teaching. Amen, brother. Amen. That's what an example. And as I, as I was reading the book again for the first time in a long time, mm. um, it just it just impressed me that it, it, on me that the two guys who wrote this thing are now in heaven, both of yeah. them, uh, a, a father and a son who, who both, you know, it's interesting because <clears throat> dad, our dad, his father, our grandfather, Grandpa Crab, was a good dad. He was a good dad to, to Uncle Bill and to our dad, to Larry Jr. And he didn't have a father. His father, and you'll read in the book when you people get this book, and please go to largerstory.com to get a copy. It's well worth the read. And it gives, I, I hope, people an opportunity to see what's what's possible and what, what being a father can mean. But he was raised with a father. Our grandfather, his father passed away when he was five years old. And there's a, a chapter two in the, the book that talks about what it's like to, to, to lose your father when your father's 30 years old. It kind of made me think, Ken, of, of our cousin Curtis, who lost his father, my dad's brother. There's also a chapter in the book about this. He was killed in a plane crash flying from Denver to Colorado Springs in March of 1991. So a few years before this book came out. And Curtis was, at the time, early 20s. Junior in college. Yeah, junior yeah. in college. So he's 20, 21, maybe. 20, 21 years old. And yeah. made me think if we lost our dad when we were 20, 21 years old, you'd have been 18 years old. Maybe I'm 23 and you're 21. What would that have been like? Because I mean, the the, the, the the wisdom that he poured into us from, I want to say from 30 on was just unbelievably different. He even talks about that a little bit in this book. What What would that be like? Because his father, grandpa, saw his dad as the big, tough guy, 30 years old, strong, healthy, young man. We've seen our dad that way. He was a big, strong, tough, young man. We, we thought dad was the strongest guy in the world. But we've also seen him laying on a hospice bed where he, he can't get up. Yeah. And so we had a chance to, to go through all the phases of that with our father. And that just, to me, is just so priceless that we've had it that is. opportunity. Another blessing, Ken. No, it's a huge blessing. I, I think one of the things that that re-impacted me about this book is just the openness of the struggles. Uh, yeah. Grandpa Crab was not a perfect dad. And, and our dad, you know, our relationship with him grew as we knew about his struggles, right? Not, not about his perfection, not about when we we're five years old or six years old, looking up to him as the strongest guy in the world and smartest guy in the world. And um, I've, I've said to anyone that'll listen, my dad was my hero since the time I had a hero. And that was more true um, when I was 50 years old and he passed away. Um, but he wasn't a perfect hero. No, it was not Jesus yeah. Christ. And, yeah. and, but it was, it was in, and I think the book, book does a good job with that. None of us are without flaw. Yep. None of us are without sin. And he talks about that wrestle in here. It's, yeah. it's not ignored. It's not, hey, everything's rosy. Life is perfect, and I do a great job. I mean, Grandpa was so terrified of failure. He was he was raised in poverty, and uh, an entrepreneur. Um, you know, owned his own business, and it, it he was terrified of failure. Um, talks about his fears, and and that that message. I think one thing that really struck me was when Dad was getting more well known. Um, Inside Out had come out before this book, and that was obviously a huge bestseller. Um, I read that. When did that come out? 88 came out in 1988. So this was 94. So years after that. And so dad's, you know, star was certainly on the rise or at its peak at that time. And grandpa crab was so terrified of failure that he was always, Hey, Larry, be careful, be careful, be careful. And, and dad didn't appreciate that. And his message to us was always go for it. <laughs> right. It was the exact opposite. And so, and that came yeah. from, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the one of the parts of their relationship that wasn't perfect. And that's okay. I mean, that that's life. I mean, if we're going to read this book and pretend that everybody's 
every relationship. I think our grandpa was as good a dad as you could have. Uh, and, and, and our dad certainly thought that. Um, and I think our dad was as good as you could have for sure. Uh, but, yeah. you know, it's, it's about charging through those struggles and charging through those doubts and living faithfully to the end, which both of those men did beautifully. And this book outlines clearly. <laughs> I mean, I don't think there's anything in the book that says, wow, that their life was simple. No. Um, this was an easy, this was an easy walk. Um, you know, I mean, dad even talked about some of his struggles that he had when he was our age now. And yeah. respect to mom, I, he says, he says in the book at one point, you know, hey, we've got some things going for us. We're both doing good, whatever. If we can stay on this road, we've got a, we've got a pretty rosy picture. And he says how naive I was at that, at that point, as you know, as he was thinking through that. And I, I think I experienced some of that and going through the stuff with Kimmy and in respect, you think, wow, you know, we've got this lick now. Okay. Well, boom. And God says, no, I still, I'm still pulling you in. And that's through the difficult times. I think that's why, what I, I think the, the point too, that I come away with this from this book with is <clears throat> you see these kids being raised without fathers. Some of them have strong grandparents. Some of them have strong mothers, some of them, whatever, some of them have none of that. Um, yeah. The need for that is so important and I think the thing that we both talked about before we jumped on live here was that we all have a father who's perfect, <laughs> you know, right. and, and that's the thing to embrace and to understand that. So grandpa did that and understanding that, you know, I mean, uh, there's, there's a, there's a letter in the book that I'll read a little bit of it here in a moment that, that is, is our grandfather writing a letter to his father who he didn't know. Uh, from from age five on in his life, and I don't know how many of us look back on age zero to five and think that that was such a huge piece of life in terms of knowing things. So he didn't know his father very well, but he remembered him. His, he remembered him a little bit, and he remembered his legacy. And one of the things that stood out in the book too that just I just am reminded of is Dad was in the introduction. He talks about when Grandpa passed away, and I was actually with Grandpa. That was the only person I've been with that I, I've seen go and take their last breath. Um, he found a spiral notebook that grandpa had and they called them the midnight yeah. rambles. You remember that? Yep, sure. Grandpa, said, grandpa says just four things real quickly here. I just read them. He says, my most severe trial of faith has long been my mother's poverty. Watching his mother struggle, I think was very difficult for grandpa. I can only imagine that. We've seen a little bit of that with our mom. Um, how I wish I could have known my father. Oh. I feel I've made such little contribution. And this is the one that gets me. Will I be missed when I die? And then the last one, if only I could express what I feel toward my wife and sons. What, what, what a legacy we come from, bro. Yeah, I still think about Grandpa Crab. I mean, maybe not every day, but probably close to every day, if it's not every day. Yeah. And it, it was, again, to another non-perfection uh, grandpa really didn't feel like he had a leadership role and he, because he had an eighth grade education. Yeah. He, he was, a probably the equivalent of a PhD in English literature. He was one of the best read, um, people Certainly you're in theology <laughs> on the planet. And I think one of my favorite memories, uh, of our dad and also of grandpa is they would sit on wingback chairs in any house we were in next to each other for hours with their Bibles open. And they did that in front of a fireplace. I can't count the number of times I saw Many. grandpa and dad sitting on wingback chairs with their Bibles open. And I don't think, I mean, can you imagine if, if one of the best things you did as a father is your kids just saw you reading the Bible all the time? Yeah, right. I mean, that, that, that means something. I, I remember saying to dad, and, and dad did the same thing, uh, and this story's in the book, but one of their favorite uh, radio programs was Red Skelton. Yep. And grandpa was sitting in front of the fireplace with his Bible open and dad was maybe 12. And he went in and said, Hey dad, let's go watch Red Skelton. And grandpa was in Leviticus. And he said, Oh no, Larry, I can't. I'm really into something right here, right now. And that created a whole, as Chris said earlier in the intro, a holy curiosity. He's like, what in the world in this 12 year old boy, he's going, what in the world could possibly be in Leviticus? that is going to be more entertaining than Red Skelton on the radio. It was actually on the TV. It was one of those oh. little black and white, you know, with the, uh, the rabbit ears antennas. I think I remember the TV well, because I think they yeah, had, yeah, I do the only that. one they had. 
you know, it's interesting when you start talking about that, bro, because one of the things that I, I made a comment of in my notes as I was reading through this and reading all of grandpa's pieces in the book is how much scripture he puts in his writing. Oh, it's yeah. just loaded with passages. He's in yeah. Isaiah, he's in Psalms, he's in the New Testament. He's all over the place talking about scripture. And it's like, wow, the love he had for the word was passed on to our father. And our father did pass that on to us. I remember dad saying to me one time, I have to read the Bible like I have to breathe. Yeah. And I remember looking at him like, what? What are you talking about? And I think I understand that a little bit more now. I'm starting to understand dad in a, in a way that I didn't understand him when he was alive that I wish I did. And you, you can't do that without having your Bible open a lot. I mean, one of my favorite things and my favorite preacher of all time and Bible teacher is uh, Dr. Larry Crabb. Um, ugh. Yeah. Uh, you go ahead. I'll, I'll finish my thought. Okay, I got it. I'm back. Um, and dad would sit up there and anytime he'd preach, he'd come up with these different passages or different excerpts of the Bible. And he's like, well, that, like when you're in Isaiah, and if you remember, you know, Jonah and second Kings, and of course he prophesied growth, which he was, and he just jumps all over the Bible, like no Bible teacher I ever heard. It was just incredible. He could, he could link every book together. And I think it was, it was both your wife and mine, Kimmy and Leslie that heard him preach. And he did that with about 17 different passages in a five minute stretch. And, and we were at lunch and they said, how do you do that? And he, and it was, he's immersed. I, I, himself. I, I spend about four or five hours every single day reading the Bible. <laughs> I think I look at our grandfather in respect to this book. And this was a book that really talks about a son's reflection. And what, what did, what did, what did they pass on? What, what have they left us now that the dad and grandpa aren't here. And you start to think about that. And I love the, the, the question that he asks is, will I be missed when I die? There's actually, there's actually a chapter in there, a chapter of that book that talks about, about that. And I look at what dad's done and I miss him every day. Every day. But so many other people do too. Because he yeah. was so impacted. It was so good. It was, it's, it's the kind of father that, that I want to be, I know you want to be. And I look at our grandpa and I, I think you can, you can hear it in the, in the book all the way through. What a hard working servant of Jesus. Yeah. 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 He was committed to displaying Christ to others. And he was committed to the word. I think the, the greatest legacy that he left um, our dad was his love for the word of God. And, yeah. and that, that has an impact on eternity that can never be changed. And I think that, I mean, it's, it's just so powerful. I get up, I'm in a Saturday morning Bible study here and my, and it's very early on Saturday. And I usually get back before my teenage girls are even out of bed, of course, but they do wonder. They're like, Oh my gosh, dad, we went and saw Top Gun Maverick Friday. We got home late and, you know, and you're getting up early to go to the Bible study. And that's a really healthy thing for my kids to see. Yeah. Um, I want to, I want to get up early and go study the Bible. Yeah. I, I, I love the example. And I, I look at our kids and the example that they're getting from us and the example that we've gotten from dad and the example that he got from his, his father, our grandfather. And I just hope I'm living up to some of that. Yeah, I think the book was really encouraging for me because we're all aware of our failures. Uh, we may not admit them openly, yeah. but I mean, I, I've got shortcomings out the wazoo uh, and, and so did Larry Sr. and Larry Jr. And they battled through. I think one of my favorite dad stories was my friend Craig Matheson and kept, you know, the story well, of course, but he said to dad 13 days before he went to see Jesus, he said, Larry, what has become more clear in your journey, in your relationship with Jesus Christ as you near heaven's gate and did not break a second, said, we live by faith, not by sight. And then teared up and said, can you imagine? I'm not going to be living by faith soon. I'll be seeing Jesus. Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's just, it's just such a legacy, such an important book. I'm so grateful for it. I do want to read, I talked to you, you all that are listening now that my grandfather, his father passed away when he was five years old. When he turned 80 years old, he wrote his, his father, he called him Papa. He wrote him a letter. This is in the book and I'm not going to read the whole letter and Ken will actually spend a little time reading a letter that our father wrote to us that's in the back of the book. And I think what we want to convey as we talk about this and, and wrap up today is the importance of pouring in to those around you, your wife, your children, and, and the impact that you really will have and maybe don't even realize, and you might not even experience it. I don't know if my grandfather ever felt that he had any impact, but, but man, you're talking to two of his grandkids and he did. Yeah. So this is what he said to his dad when he was 80 years old after losing his father 75 years earlier. <clears throat> I've wanted to do this for a long time. I know your address, but whether or not you'll read this is in the Lord's hands, his pierced hands. How fantastic it must be to be with the one who loved you and gave himself for you. When you left us with hush, God is in it. There were mother and four children, and we five, now Mabes, his sister Mabel, and I are the only ones left on earth. The family has expanded. Cecil had a boy. I had two boys. You've already met Bill. Oh. Helen had a boy, and Mabel had two girls. I always think I have two families. The family which I was born into, and the family that began when Isabel said yes. Mother told us, of the time you introduced her to some friends with, I know you'll like her. I do. I can't wait to introduce you to Isabel. You'll like her. I do. He goes on to talk about the fact that his dad would be 106 years old when he wrote this letter. He pictures his dad behind a desk as a handsome 30 year old sitting there in a wide armed chair with his mother, a woman standing behind him with both her hands on his shoulders and a smile on her face that says, this is my man. Grandpa took care of his mother until she died. She was a blind woman who used to pray for them like crazy. But that's the legacy that Ken and I come from. And he's going to read you a passage in the book now of a letter that dad wrote us in this book. So yeah, you, I think one interesting point before I read this letter um, is, is our dad lived long enough to where earlier on in his ministry, he was very concerned about his impact and feeling his impact. He really got over that. I remember the last sermon he preached at Cornerstone Bible Church uh, in Ohio. He finished doing two services there and came to the door and I said, how do you think it went? And he said, I don't care. It's up to the Holy Spirit now. I'm hungry. Let's go get a hamburger. <laughs> so, so he, uh, and, and earlier on in his uh, ministry, he would go in the men's bathroom and hide out in the stall to hear what people would really say. And he didn't really, he didn't worry about that toward the end of his life. Uh, oh, but this was a letter and I may struggle cap so you can pick up, um, where I get off. Yeah. Uh, I'm on page 165. Yep. Dear Cap and Ken, I've never told you Oh, man, I may not have a chance here. I, met, I never told you completely how much you need to me because I can't. As my dad would say, the deepest bonds cannot be expressed in words. Through your mother, I have passed the miracle of life onto you. You are both fully individuals, unique and separate, but you are also extensions of the life that my father passed on to me and his father to him. I remember, as if it were yesterday, staring at each of you in your cribs, many times crying. I would kneel with tears of love and joy and hope pouring down my cheeks. I would lay my hand on you and pray, God, make them yours. Remove the deception. Let them see how good you are. Give them your life, and may they give their lives to you. I've been so scared. Sometimes my fears overcame my love, and I lashed out. I demanded of you things that must come from your own desires and choices. I couldn't bear the thought of Satan winning, <laughs> winning in your lives. I was willing uh, yeah. to be so controlled by fear. God told me to rest, to trust him, and to believe in you. 
Instead, I sometimes took matters into my own hands, forgetting that only love, never pressure, draws people to God. Forgive me, and don't let me get in the way. In your late teens and early 20s, I spent many nights in my study until the early morning, praying with more passion than I can describe. On so many occasions, my words over and over were, Lord, give me my boys. Let me enjoy them as godly men. I trembled before God, praying until I was too exhausted to say another word. I never heard God speak to me, but several times I sensed him smiling and saying, trust me. I sense that when I pray. Yeah. I fear I've given you the impression that godly living can be a rather joyless struggle. <laughs> With all my heart, I wish I knew more of the joy that I'm convinced God intends us to know. My life has been and still is a battle. More than once, I've come close to quitting. Personal failures can seem overwhelming. Deep pain that I cannot explain is sometimes too much. But I can't quit. He never did. Nope. I've tasted his grace. Every time I fail, I sense he is saying that he's not through with me. He forgives me and wants me to get up and get back on the path. And the pain, even at its worst, has never overcome my hope. I know that living now for Christ is worthwhile, despite the struggles, and that a better day, a fantastic day is coming. Yeah. It's probably too long to finish for this, but let me just get you to the last paragraph here. Um, but it's it's definitely worth reading and, and writing something like this to your kids. Oh, there are no two men whom I love more than you two. Yeah. Complete my joy by committing your lives to telling his story. Let your minds imagine the scene of your grandparents and mine and theirs before them gathering for a huge family reunion. Your Uncle Bill will grab his guitar. He'll play it better than Mother and I will smile at each other as we've never smiled before. Leslie and Kimmy. Leslie and Kimmy will be laughing and singing, and then we'll become quiet. The Lord will step into the middle of the circle and invite each of you to tell the story of how you live for him on earth. You'll both burst with humble joy as you reflect on your decisions that honor the Savior. You'll slap each other on the back with excitement over how your lives counted. Yes. And when you finish your tale, the Lord will smile with a tenderness that will forever amaze us all. Will embrace you and say, Well done, it's time for the party. Can you imagine watching my father dance in ways that not even he understands the best is yet to come? Kep, I love you, live for Christ. And I love you, live for Christ, Dad. Woo! No impact. <laughs> Those kind of things matter, people. And um, you have the chance to matter. And I, I asked myself this the book did two things for me. It says how much I miss dad and miss grandpa um, and the legacy that they have in the role of, of, of fathers. And I want to challenge you guys. What is your legacy? What are you leaving when we die? Because we're going to die. And what are we going to leave? What are we going to leave those we love? What are we going to leave those that we've touched? So I would just challenge you today. Um, challenge yourself to write letters to people, to engage in ways that maybe aren't as comfortable. And um, I think you're going to see dividends that actually you may never see. You may never realize the impact that you've had until you're gone. Um, but through the Holy Spirit, we all have the opportunity to have that impact. So, Ken, thanks for joining me today, bro. Um, yeah, I, knew was, I knew it was going to be emotional talking about dad. Yeah. With Father's Day coming up, it makes it a little more. This is our second Father's Day. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, it's still, that's a tough day. Yeah. But it's a, uh, it's such a day of rejoicing. I'm so yep. grateful. We're so blessed, but we're all blessed people. Not everyone had Larry Crabb as a father. He and I are the only two that did, but we all have our heavenly father who's way better <laughs> if that's possible. And I know it is. Yeah. So uh, I just say, what, what legacy do you want to leave? What do you want to leave as a, as a, as a father? as a man, but as a mother, as a woman as well, it applies. Pour into your kids, pour into those you love. Thanks guys for joining us. We'll see you on July 27th and we'll be chatting through the book connecting. Have a happy Father's Day. God bless y'all. God bless.